Amen. Amen. All right. Well, today we're going to have a one-off message before we begin uh, a new sermon series, a new message series next week that's going to take us through the fall. Next week, we're going to begin a series called The Kingdom, the Gospel of Luke. And most of the small groups will be based on that. And what we have outside uh, today is this little booklet. It's for the small groups. It goes through the first several chapters that we'll be covering this fall in the Gospel of Luke. Pick one up. They're free. If you're in a small group, definitely pick one up. If you're not in a small group, you may still pick one up anyway, but it'll help you again kind of track with us as we go through the series. But today, as I said, just a one-off deal. And I want to tell you that I believe for some... The message today has the potential to be the most important message that that you'll hear all year. It's got the potential to change your life for years to come. It's not because of any great insight that I've got or any clever words I'm going to speak, but it's because I think it brings out a revelation that God has for us here that is for now, for today for you, and I challenge you to listen to it, to put your guard down, and to... Ask God, what's the next step for you in applying what his word says with this, okay? The big idea, here it comes, drum roll. Right connections, right relationships in life matter. If you get them right, it sets you up for success in every area of life that matters. If you get them wrong, the opposite's going to be true. The big thought that I ask that you hold on to is this. You show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. And that isn't really something I came up with. That is something that the wisest man in the world, other than Jesus, came up with, Solomon. He said it, a little bit different wording, in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Let's look at how he said that. He said, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, okay, I get it for you Bible scholars out there who will say Proverbs isn't about promises, Proverbs is about possibilities. Take that as you will. I see that as a promise from God. You walk with the wise, and what does he promise? You'll be wise. You walk with the foolish, and what happens? You're going to suffer harm. You're going to suffer harm. I mean, it's like... Okay, if you don't take it as a promise, take it as a very high probability. Very high probability. I mean, the idea is, again, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It, it matters who you hang around with. Your mama was right when she told you that, right? Your mama said you're going you're gonna to hang around with those hoodlums and turn into a hoodlum. That's what she told me. Hoodlum was a big word back then. Okay, she, she told me I was going to turn into one. And you know what? I did. I did. It, it's like you become who you're with. Bad company corrupts good morals. Wise company creates wisdom. The idea is that we have been challenged by the Bible to up our game, to look for people better than us, to look for people wiser than us, to look for people who handle their money better than us, to look for people who know how to handle marriage and parenting better than us, to look for people who know God better than us. That's the idea. That's the idea. And what do we do? So often, most of us, hang around with the people that we're most comfortable with who are what? Either the most like us or maybe a step down from us so they don't challenge us. That's what we do. That's the reality of how we work it. And how's that been going for you? I mean, that's the question some of you need to ask. Not everybody, I know, but some of you need to ask, how's that working for you? Are you circling the same mountain today that you were circling last year at this time? Are you, are, you, are you in the same ruts today that you were in five years ago? Well, consider for a moment what the reasons might be with, with all, of, all, of, all of this. The Christian life is actually kind of like a recipe that, that God has laid out for us. If you include all of the ingredients in the recipe that God gives us in Scripture, you are likely to come out with the best life possible. If you leave out an ingredient, what happens when you leave out an ingredient in a recipe? I mean, the recipe comes out junk. And the same thing basically happens in life. If we think we can put life together, but we leave out an essential ingredient in the recipe that God has said is supposed to be part of the recipe, then then we certainly aren't going to have the best life possible. And the ingredient 
that so many of us leave out is the right kinds of relationships. Now, right now, some of you already, outside especially, some of you already, you are out there right now already making excuses because you know where I'm going with this. You know that this is the week where I pump small groups. This is the week where we're getting down to the line, and I'm going to tell you you need to get in a small group, and you're already making excuses for that. But the idea is that if you want breakthrough in your life, the first step is to stop making excuses. The first step for breakthrough in any area of life is to stop making excuses. Yet you can live an isolated Christian life and you can still make it to heaven. But you cannot live an isolated Christian life and have the things on this earth go the way they're supposed to go. Others of you are saying, well, I'm not living isolated. I've got friends. I've got plenty of friends. And maybe that's good. But the question you need to be asking, are they the right ones? Are they the right ones. I mean, some of us need to do a friend shift right now and make some changes. The idea is this. Satan, our enemy, is a maestro of mediocrity. What he does is he orchestrates as a maestro the people in our lives so often and brings in the negative voices and brings in the competing voices and brings in the unwise advice and basically does anything that he can to keep you in your present routine. See, so often, Satan's not trying to change anything in your life. He's trying to keep you just the same as you are. And that's a strategy that we just are asleep to, that, that God is about changing us. God is about growing us. Satan is about keeping things the same. And it's, it's understanding that this is what happens so often. He wants to keep you stuck in less than the best. Jesus' advice, his advice Mark 4.24. Mark 4.24, one piece of a lot of advice that he gave in a lot of different areas was this to his disciples. Take care what you listen to. Take care what you listen to. Take care who you listen to. Again, you know, it's so mind-blowing to me how how with some people, you are taking in advice from your friends, taking in advice from people who are just like you. And who are you looking for advice from? The people who are just like you, the people who are suffering from the same struggles and problems that you are. And you're taking the advice from them. Why? Because they have straightened their lives out? No. You're taking your advice from somebody who's in a worse position than you are so often because they're saying what you want to hear because they're saying things that affirm you in the rut that you're in. They're saying things that tell you you can keep circling the same mountain over and over again because they are, and it's all going just, just fine for them. Uh, again, the, the idea is, is that we need friendships and we need the right friendships. <sighs> With the idea of friendships, of relationships, I think we need to start all the way back in Genesis and understand that God created us for relationships. God created us for relationships, he made us for relationships, and then relationships make us who we become. Now, I say he made us for relationships because we are made and we're created in what? The image of God. And who is God? He is a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, relationships have been around for eternity. There was never a point in time when relationships did not exist. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the perfect relationship, and I know that's hard to understand. I don't pretend to understand it, but it's presented as true, and it's there. So he made Adam in his image, and then what happens after he makes Adam? He says, this is not good. Why? Because that which was made in his image carried with it that attribute of needing relationship. And God said, okay, this isn't good because he doesn't have a relationship. So created woman. And he said, now this is very good. Now this is very good. You know, the, the, the weird deal is, is, the irony in this, is that loneliness is the one single problem that we have in life because we are created in the image of God, right? Right? I mean, any other problem you have is because you and I deviate from the image of God. But loneliness is the one problem we have because we are created in the image of God. And it's, it's something that's kind of interesting in terms of how it's become an, an epidemic. In fact, I was reading this week that in the United Kingdom uh, over the past year, in an article it said this, 
Loneliness has reached such epidemic proportions in the UK that Prime Minister Theresa May has appointed a Minister for Loneliness to the Cabinet of the United Kingdom. A minister for loneliness. That's, that sounds weird, right? A minister for loneliness to the cabinet of the United Kingdom. And then in, in the U.S., former, a former U.S. Surgeon General uh, wrote an article. It was actually last year in the September 2017 Harvard Business Review titled Work and the Loneliness Epidemic. He said, he was a doctor, he said the most common pathology he saw as a doctor was not heart disease or cancer, it was loneliness, just people alone. He says, loneliness has more than doubled since the 1980s, with well over 40% of Americans reporting that they suffer from loneliness at a significant level. And, and why is that? Well, it's because people more than ever move apart from family. It's because people more than ever move a lot. And I'd say that's especially true in Hawaii. I mean, very few people, very few of you guys moved here for relationships, you moved here for the weather, you moved here to get away from the relationships perhaps, but you didn't move here for relationships. But that doesn't take away from the fact that you need them, that you were created for them, and that you're not going to function well w without them. Uh, anyway, he goes on to write that same article. He says that loneliness is a health hazard. He says it's worse for your health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, as well as crushing your soul. Now, you look at this and you go, somebody ought to do something about this. And the thing is, God did. He, he created church. Now, when I say that, it doesn't mean that he created this idea of steeples and buildings and, you know, places where we sit in rows on Sunday mornings. He created church as a place of, of people coming together. He created church as a means for relationships to be established. If you think of churches where you come in and you sit here and listen to me or somebody else talk on a Sunday morning, I failed and you don't get church. I have failed in conveying what church is because church isn't about looking at the back of somebody's head. Church is about coming together in relationships where there's a one anotherness that's carried out. The New Testament uses this little phrase, one another, 59 times. 59 times in terms of how we're to do one another, how we're to be one another doers, how we're to get better at doing one another to one another. And the idea is we need to understand how to make that happen. Now, for us, the best strategy that we've been able to get in place to see people move into significant relationships is to develop this idea of, of small groups. Small groups where people can come together in smaller numbers, where they can sit in circles, where they can look at each other, where they can talk to each other instead of, like today, just being talked at. It's the idea where you can come together and, and experiment with some things, where you can exercise spiritual gifts, where you can move into this, this place where you're known and where people know you. It's, it's the beginning point, really, for pastoral care. The way we set up small groups here is we've got small group leaders who are the ones who provide you with the first steps of pastoral care. If you've got a problem, you need to be in a small group for that person or people who are the leaders, leaders of the group to be able to either provide the care for you in the group or to be able to refer you to us and others that can help you with the next steps. Otherwise, you're hanging out there by yourself and you don't contact anybody and then things go bad and then they get worse and then they get worse and finally it's to the crisis point where you say, help! And we go, well, who's your small group leader? Well, I don't have one. Well, first step is go way back over here to step one and get in a small group. It's the idea where people can come together to provide you with that connection point that, that you need. It, like I said, it's also where the one another commands really can start coming alive for you. How we love one another. How we care for one another. How we carry one another's burdens. How we hold one another accountable. How we do the one another's. You can't do too many one another's on a Sunday morning. It's hard to understand what the needs are for one another's, unless you're talking to one another to understand what their life is really like. And again, that's what relationships are, are all about. Relationships that matter, that actually can make all the difference between having what John 10.10 10 says is the abundant life Jesus Christ came to bring us, 
or what John 10.10 also says is the life of destruction that the enemy wants to have for us. It's what makes all the difference in the world. Just a quick personal testimony. I mean, I started my Christian life out when I was in my mid-20s with a small group in Tallahassee, Florida. I mean, it made all the difference in the world for me. Looking back at that time, I can't tell you the subject matter of a single sermon that was preached during the years that I was in Tallahassee. Not a single one. Great preacher, great teacher, brilliant man, godly man. And I'm sure stuff came in and like unbeknownst to me, sunk down and did something in me, but I don't remember it. What I do remember is what happened in that group where we sat around and had dinner together every Saturday night, where we shared life together, where we talked about the scripture and how it applies. I learned how to be a husband. I learned how to be a father. I learned how to manage money. I learned how to hear God. I learned how to live life. And the relationships that, that came from the, the few years that I was in that group have carried over till today. Had to move from Tallahassee for another job, Melbourne, Florida, one of the first things that we did, plugged into a small group. Got in that small group, again, same thing, same thing happened with lives being knit together. Going back in February to have the, the wedding of, of friends there that we have known for years. It's been 25 years since we've watched one of the daughters in that group, you know, grow up into the woman she is now, and, and she's getting married. The relationships are in place still. Ovita, Florida, the next move before coming to Hawaii, same thing, small group. Got here to Kona, and what happened? God's saying start a church for the first almost 10 years. The full funding came from people in those two, three small groups. I mean, the reason we sit here today is because of relationships that were started and continued over a period of over 20 years with people who had a vision to, to see what's going on here go on now. It's the idea that this is where life happens. This is where you develop real friendships. This is where the vision that God has for you is shared with people who want to encourage the vision or help you refine the vision. It's, it's what really matters in terms of, of how life's going to be done. There are three kinds of friendships that I can say came from my small group experiences and three kinds of friendships that I think we all ought to be looking for in our small group experiences. And it's something that you see in the life of King David. It's something that you see Solomon writing a lot about in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is something that's interesting, interesting to me. Okay, Proverbs, written by Solomon primarily. Again, wisest guy besides Jesus who ever lives. And Solomon talks a whole lot about friendships in Proverbs. Read through all 31 chapters and friendships, relationships, over and over and over again are addressed. What's interesting to me is I'm thinking, okay, well, what happened with this? Yeah, God inspires it, obviously. But I'm thinking, too, that... Solomon watched his father David and saw the relationships that his father David had. And part of what God uses when he brings inspirations through somebody is, is to use the experiences that they've had as the filter through which those revelations are given. And so what did he see with David? Well, three kinds of friendships that, that I think, again, I think we each need to have. Number one, we need to have a crown bestower in our life, a crown bestower in our life. That's what, that's what Samuel, the prophet Samuel, was for David. That is, somebody who sees what God's doing, who sees who you are, and calls you up into the things that God is doing. I mean, sometimes it's a prophetic voice, a supernatural gifting of prophecy, but you know, sometimes it's somebody that just has some good old-fashioned common sense that can see who you are, what you look like, what the circumstances are in your life and what the needs are around you, and is able to call you up into the purposes of God so that you can step into the destiny that God has for you. Second, second kind is a faithful companion. You need them. I need them. Jonathan was that for David. Somebody who walks in when everybody else walks out. Somebody who's there with that no matter what kind of love for you. Somebody who's willing to stand against the, the, the flow against you when you need somebody standing with you the, the most. And, and then number three, this is the toughest, toughest kind of friend to have. Number three, we need a loyal wounder, maybe more than one a loyal wounder. And that's what the prophet Nathan was for David, right? Somebody who confronted him in his sin. 
And we need people in our life who are going to tell us the truth. I mean, so many times, what do we, we want people that just agree with us. We want people that encourage us and tell us, yeah, whatever you're doing, God is going to bless it. No, he's not. He's not. And we need people to tell us the truth, that everything we're doing, everything we think, everything we're going after isn't what we need to be doing, thinking, or going after. Now, this isn't for everybody in your life, but I suspect that what you need to do is, like me, you need to deputize one or two people. Deputize them. Basically, give them a hunting license and say, I want you going after my blind spots. I give you permission to address my blind spots. Yeah, I know it's scary. I know that can go and that can backfire and cause a huge mess. I get it. But the alternative is more catastrophic. To continue on with those blind spots in place, doing what? Never changing. Staying right where the enemy wants you to stay doing the same thing, maintaining the same habits, walking in the same ruts. And this isn't what what God has for for any any one of us. It reminds me of the account in John chapter 5 with the guy who's been crippled since birth, who's lying around at the pool of Bethesda, right? Jesus comes up to this guy, he's been lying there forever on his pallet, and says, do you want to be healed? Seems like a cruel and obvious question. And what does the guy do? The guy immediately launches into excuses why he hadn't been healed. Who hasn't helped him? Who's gotten in the way? What he needs from other people? What other people have done to get in the way? And this isn't written in the text, but the implication is Jesus says, "I, I don't care about that. I didn't ask you about that. I said, do you want to be healed? If so, get past the excuses, stand up, take up your pallet, and walk. I mean, it's, I think, what Jesus is saying to some of us. He's saying, first thing today that you need to do is to resolve. I'm going to get past the excuses. Yes, there are people who have stood in my way. Yes, there are people who have failed to help me. Yes, there are people who have, have actively opposed me. But get past the excuses and take up the responsibility for the next step that God has for you. And, and be ready to, to move on with that. Again, the help that we want to provide is not one that can say, okay, I'm matching you two people up in the perfect relationship. Or I'm matching you five people up so that you fulfill all of the roles of a friend that you see in Proverbs in these relationships. Now, the only thing we can do is provide a venue, an environment. And small groups and the team ministries that we provide are the best thing that we know how to do in order to provide the venue, the environment within which these, these friendships, these relationships can, can be developed. Now, that said, meeting in small groups is not an automatic cure for everything. It's not, it's not the automatic formula for maturity and for spiritual growth unless they are small groups in which certain things happen. And I want to lay out five certain things that if they happen, then, then, and only then, we'll give you the money-back guarantee for the group, okay? So these are the five practices that actually will make a group group work. Other things need to come in too, but these five things are essential. Number one, number one, remove the masks. Remove the masks. Small groups have got to be a place where you get real. Small groups have got to be a place where you're transparent with your failures and with your weaknesses. They've got to be a place where you're open about your bad motives, about your temptations, and regarding your, your, your victories, the victories that you've, you've experienced. The way the small groups will start off this week, for example, is not by jumping into a Bible study. The small groups will start off this week by everybody simply sitting around and introducing themselves. Nothing that's going to require you to say something that's embarrassing, but basically for people to have an opportunity to get to know you so that you can be known and you can get to know other people for who they are. It's the beginning step. It's a process. It's a process of growing intimacy that, that happens. But, but it's got to start this way, and it's got to start by having a willingness to, to get real and remove the masks. Just to caution real quickly, what shuts that down? What will shut transparency down very quickly is, number one, inappropriate humor. 
Okay? I'm all about being funny. I'm not that funny, but I'm all about trying to be funny sometimes. I think Jesus was kind of a funny guy. I think he told some jokes and it just goes right over our head. That whole log in the eye bit, that was a joke. We were supposed to laugh at that and take the substance of truth that he had in it. But the idea is inappropriate humor in a small group can shut things down completely. And you need to be very careful with, with trying to be funny when you start feeling nervous, which is what some people do, and in the process, shut people down by the inappropriate humor. Second thing that shuts it down, shuts down transparency, is judgment. Judgment. You're going to get in a small group and you're going to hear some people say some things that you think, that is scandalous. And you're thinking, right, it is scandalous. But you don't judge them for it. The whole idea is they're taking a step of transparency. They're saying, I got an issue here. I got a problem here. And I'm letting you know about it. And so you've got to not get into the finger wagging you can't even start quoting scripture back at people right off the bat. You, you just let them say what they need to say so you can get to know them initially. Yeah, there's a place for accountability. There's a place for speaking the truth. We talked about that just a second ago. But it's not the first tool out of the shed. It's what we've got to understand is something that's, that's used as you gain credibility as you gain relationship with somebody. So watch it on the judgment. Number two, second thing really with a small group is application. Application has got to come into play. Look at James chapter one, verse 23. How do I apply the word in my life? If you're in a small group and all you do in a small group is study the Bible, you're not doing enough. You can study the Bible all your life and unless that study of the Bible moves into application, then it is worthless. It's worthless. You want to, yes, we're going to be looking at scripture in the groups, but we want to immediately move into application. The application of it, not the application of it with all those terrible people out there. Not the application of it with your cousin, who if he were here, I'd really like to stuff this down his throat. The application with you, with you. It's always personal with you. That's where the application is about. Get selfish with this. Get self-centered with this. Application is about each one of us individually. If you get in a group and you see them veering off away from application, reel them back in and challenge them on this. Say, we heard that these groups were supposed to be about application. And if they still don't come back into where they need to be with the application, come and talk to me or Andrew or Ryan. We'll get you in a different group. We'll put you in a different group and we'll fire that group leader. The idea is you, you, you need to be in a place where application is coming into play. Number three, number three, there needs to be accountability. Accountability. The, the idea is that <clears throat> from time to time, you and I need to make some commitments. Some commitments of things that are going to change. I am going to quit using my credit cards. I am going to make sure my credit card is paid off at the end of every month or I'm going to quit using it. And I give you permission to check me on this, to ask me about this, to hold me accountable to this. Now, accountability is something where I believe you need to give, give people permission to hold you accountable. But the idea is, you know, what's your next step of obedience? Where is it that God is calling you to grow and understand that you need help with growing that way. And allow other people to be in on the game with you so that you can, you can have that accountability that, that comes in, into play with it. With money, with evangelism. Maybe you feel committed to, to evangelism. You say, I feel like I'm supposed to share the gospel with three people every week. Well, get in your group and <laughs> give them permission to, to ask you, give me the names of the three people that you shared the gospel with this week. But whatever it is, have, have that as a part of it where there's a degree of accountability that comes in. So in general, you have people that can ask you how your obedience is going. Number four, guidance. Guidance. The idea <clears throat> is that people in your group and you and me are constantly facing decisions about all sorts of things. And our tendency when decisions come in is to be impulsive, to make decisions with too little information, to make decisions based on emotions and not facts, to make decisions based on our perception. And see, the idea is decision making is very often, if not usually, supposed to be a corporate activity. 
Now, I know in the U.S. we don't like that idea. So, no, I'm all about my own decision-making. Well, yeah, you've got ultimate responsibility for your decision. I've got ultimate responsibility for my decisions. But the Bible also says we need an abundance of counselors. I mean, if you look in the book of Acts in terms of how the early church started, even when they're doing something as basic as, as the Apostle Paul and Barnabas heading out on missionary trips, the whole church came together to pray and fast about whether this was a good idea or not. It's the idea that you need people that are going to help you with that, that guidance. Again, you ultimately make your own decisions. Nobody's going to control you in this. You can say, thank you for the advice, but I'm sure I'm to go this way, and you may be right. But, but you need to be in a place where you're, you're willing to take that in. I mean, one of the questions that I think we need to add to this little booklet, we didn't include it, I thought about it afterwards, is a question, you can write it in if you're a small group leader at the end of, of every chapter, the question is this, is anybody facing a significant decision this week? I mean, I don't think we ought to get out of our groups every week without asking that question, is anybody facing a significant decision this week? Because again, this is a huge deal. We want to help people in this process of understanding what scripture says, I mean, I'm thinking about leaving my husband and marrying my secretary. Well, okay. Real quickly, let's look and see what the Bible says about this. No, you can't do that, okay? Good enough. That whole, a world of trouble just avoided by asking the simple question, right? Again, the idea goes on into more nuanced situations, I understand. But, but getting those things out in the open. And then number five, finally, finally, number five. Small groups should provide encouragement. I don't know if you need as much as I do, but encouragement is something that, you know, we soak up like sponges and it runs through us like we're a sieve. I mean, it, it, we need a lot of it. All of us need a lot of encouragement. And so the small groups are where that can happen. You know, not, not false encouragement, not patting you on the head when you don't need it, but that ability to look in to see who you really are and provide you with the encouragement to maintain hope for the future, to continue to move on. It can be, again, prophetic or it can be common sense, but it's something that, that we all need to have actually poured into our lives and these things will make a group thrive if they are intentionally put into application. What we're doing, again, with the small groups is providing a context for next steps to take. Again, I talked about this a few weeks ago, but my concept, at least, of discipleship is that we need to provide people with some basic um, information, like we do with the Alpha Course, some basic foundational things in the faith. But beyond that, what we need to provide more than anything else for discipleship, for people to be followers of Jesus, how do you follow Jesus? By taking the next step for you to follow him. And because everybody's life is different, because everybody's at a different stage in life, different circumstances in their life, the step that you take, the step that I take, the step that Stephen Lynn take, the step that George takes, is going to be different. Not in terms of different words from the Bible, but it's going to be different in terms of the circumstances. So what do we do? How do we help people follow Jesus with the next step? Two things. Number one, help and encourage people to become adept at self-feeding to be able to read the word themselves, to be able to hear God for themselves. If we can help and encourage people to know the scriptures and to hear God, I mean, goodness, discipleship, almost completely accomplished, almost. Because even with that in place, the second thing is having the context for right relationships, small groups. So we want to have people self-feeding and we want people in small groups. So that you have, again, that circle of people around you to help you understand what the next steps are supposed to be and how to take them. Again, to check you, to check your motives, to question your obedience, to look at things that maybe you don't want anybody looking at. But that's exactly why you need to be in the small group. To help you look at things that you yourself don't want to look at and to look at them from a different perspective. Usually we've only got one. And oftentimes, we need about a half a dozen in order to get the full picture of what's going on in our lives and how it's supposed to, how it's supposed to work out. So, the application we're talking about, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25, last section of scripture we'll look at. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, our hope in Jesus, without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, we often look at this and go, well, I'm, I'm here today, right? So I'm not forsaking my own assembling together. Well, you know, when Hebrews was written, there were not church buildings that people assembled in. When Hebrews was written, I'm just not so sure they were sitting in rows staring at the backs of people's heads. When Hebrews was written, I don't think there was one person who got up talking at everybody with everybody simply listening and taking notes. I think there was instead a dialogue going on. I think there was an exchange going on. I think, yes, there was teaching. Yes, there was prophecy. Yes, there was somebody leading. But there was the opportunity for people to to have a voice to speak in, to, to talk about the realities of the application. That's the assembling together that Hebrews 10 is talking about. Assembling together face to face so that you can know and be known in, in a way that brings about what, what God wants brought about in, in our lives. So we always end with application, right? Guess what it is today? If you haven't signed up for a group, get out there and sign up for a group. We've got 22 groups, I think, I know, 21 groups, I think, that are left to to sign up for. Um, If you're looking for an easy next step in terms of a group, and you've never taken Alpha, do the Alpha course, because part of what they do is break up into small groups for 45 minutes at a time. It's an easy introduction. But otherwise, look at a small group that's out there. We've got groups that have existed for a year or so. We've got new groups. We've got one new group that just started this fall, first time out of the box, the, uh, the Van Bergen's group, Joy and Ken Van Bergen. They live right down the street here in Lee Heights. If you want to get in on the ground floor in a group to shape the, the way that group looks, jump in with the Van Bergen's group. It's a new sheet that's out there now. You can sign up. It'll be shut down at 12, so 12 people. So sign up for that if you want. But find a group that you can plug into and, and get plugged in. These are the people, as you plug in, who may be the ones who are going to help you live life, who may be the ones that can help you, again, get out of the rut and quit circling the same mountain over and over again. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the way you created us. I ask you, Father, to enable us to to be honest with ourselves, to get beyond excuses, to step into the fullness of all that you have for us, to become the people that you intend for us to be. I ask for your blessings, Father, on us as you equip us to be the conduits through which your will is done on earth here in Kona, Hawaii, as it is in heaven, as you use us to extend your kingdom. All of this, Father, we ask for our good, for your glory, and the power of Jesus Christ's name. Amen.